Hello, everyone. Welcome to the British Library South Asia Seminar Series, which is part of our digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. Today, we are very happy to have amongst us Sara Rahman Niazi, who's going to speak on From Adab to Film, Urdu Film Journals in India between 1930 and 1950. Sara is a doctoral researcher with the Center for Research and Education in Arts and Media at the University of Westminster in London. Her work is focused on the intersections between language, literature, and cinema. She received her MPhil degree for cinema and the reinvention of the self, women performers in the Bombay film industry, 1925 to 47, from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Her work has been published in journals such as Widescreen and Culture, Culture Unbound, and in books by Sage and Rutledge, among others. She works as an assistant editor of Moving Image Review and Art Journal. We are also very grateful to have Professor Iftikar Dadi as the chair for today's talk. Iftikar is an art historian, artist, and an associate professor in Cornell University's Department of the History of Art and the director of the South Asia program. He's the author of Modernism and the Art of South Asia, published in 2010, and which received the book prize from the American Institute of Pakistan Studies. He has co-curated exhibitions such as Lines of Control, and his collaborative works with Elizabeth Dadi have been presented in international exhibitions such as Homelands, Art from Bangladesh, India, India and Pakistan, Havana Biennale, Lahore Biennale, and Dhaka Art Summit. About today's talk and the format of the session, Sara would be presenting her talk for about 30 to 45 minutes, after which we have a short discussion between the speaker and the chair, following which I'll open it up for audience question and answers. In the meantime, if you would like to put in your questions, please use the question and answer box or the chat box to do so. And I will take them in order in the Q&A round. So without much further ado, I hand it over to Sara to speak on From Adab to Film, Urdu Film Journals in India from 1930 to 1950. Over to you, Sara. Uh, thank you, Priyanka. Um, and thank you to Brett and the British Library for putting this together. Um, I also want to thank uh, Professor Iftabar Dadi, who has so graciously agreed to chair this session. And I'm really looking forward to um, his engagement with my work. And of course, to all the people who are participating and assigned in to listen to this talk. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So in today's talk, I map the entangled history of the Urdu press with film journalism and explore their role in the creation of a cinematic public sphere. The place of film journalism in the matrix of cinema and its networks of distribution, circulation, and consumption cannot be overstated. By the 1930s, film journals had become part and parcel of the complex of cinema consumption. The intersection between and the transformation of literary and cinematic cultures affected by commercial printing produced a series of complex negotiations. Through the specific case studies of Urdu film journals, I look at the structure of these journals and ask, how were these similar or different to contemporary film journals? Also, I ask, can we think of the Urdu film journal as an extension of the literary, that is amalgamating other uh, literature or discourses on etiquette with film, Mapping the profound influence of literary journals on Urdu film magazines, I attempt to gauge the ways in, these, uh, in which these journals were responding to and expressing a continued engagement with notions of akla, which is moral conduct, and isla, correction or reform, which was central to contemporary articulations on morality and the reform. In the 1930s, 
while film culture was expanding and proliferating as evident from the range of film journals in diverse languages. And of course, this is also the time when in the 1930s, sound comes to cinema. So there is a huge paradigmatic shift with you know, new studios opening up, um, some old studios collapsing as well, but there's a kind of new energy that sound technology has infused uh, film industry with. Uh, however, the status of cinema was far removed from that of literary circles, for example. Uh, film journals struggled for acceptance and inclusion within the Urdu public sphere. The film magazines were often printed by publishing houses that had other literary pursuits. Or in some cases, the success of film journals helped editors establish their own publishing houses. These close connections with the Urdu press and their desire for legitimacy affected the style, format, and content of the early film journals in Urdu. And in today's talk, my main focus is on the Delhi-based journal Shama. However, I'll be using examples from a journal called Film Stage, which was published out of Calcutta, and a Lahore-based journal called Star. And here are some of the images of um, you know, the Urdu film magazines that I have looked at. Um, I also want to just sort of uh, flag that this is part of my larger work, and here I'm just presenting a very small aspect of the Urdu film journals. And these are three, um, you know, cover pages of uh, very important journals from the 1930s and 40s in this period. So Shama, when it launched in 1939, entered a tough market, and by the 1940s. Film journalism had become a legitimate publishing enterprise with possibilities for financial gain, recognition, and its own kind of stardom for film journal editors. And by the mid uh, 1940s, Shama had become a huge success. Yusuf Dehelvi, the editor of Shama, was a man of letters and a sound businessman. Um, Yusuf Dehelvi was, uh, you know, had ventured into real estate. He was also involved with leather goods and then had interests in Yunani medicines and had established, um, you know, manufacturing unit um, under the brand called Barada Vahana, which was also based in New Delhi. So he had like all these very, uh, you know, diverse business interests. Um, in 1947, he started a publishing house in Delhi along with his three sons, uh, Shama Publications. And the, um, this particular publication house catered to the Urdu reading public in both India and Pakistan post partition. Um, and of course, you know, part of the family, as you know, I was discussing before this talk with uh, Iftikhar, that uh, he told me that a part of the family member went to Karachi and set up uh, Shama, which was based out of Karachi. Um, and also, of course, they also had a you know distribution uh, office in London, to which they reached out to readers uh, of Urdu in and Hindi in Europe. So in addition to Shama, the publishing house brought out two other monthlies uh, in Urdu, which were called Banu, a journal for women, and Kilona, which was a journal for children. Kilona was edited by one of the sons called Is Ilyas Dehelvi and his brother Idris Dehelvi. Um, Banu was targeted at middle-class women, um, and it contained articles and essays uh, framed as advice for women on etiquette, domesticity, culture, and taste. These articles were carefully curated by the editorial team with images of women, cartoons, illustrations, uh, patterns for cross-stitch, contemporary advertisements for trends in fashion, makeup, recipes, but also poetry and short stories that were sort of considered suitable for women. Um, the journal was edited by uh, Zina Kossar Dehelvi and later her daughter, Sadia Dehelvi. The Shama Publishing House published various Urdu and Hindi books as well, uh, both fiction and nonfiction, and had a subsidiary called Shama Book Depot and Kilona Book Depot, which published books for children. Um, they had a Hindi journal called Sushma, and Sushma as well was a film journal and had quite a considerable amount of readership uh, in India. 
uh, but the three Urdu film, uh, Urdu magazines, uh, Bano, Kilona, and Shama, formed a kind of powerful triad that most Urdu literate families in North India subscribe to. And this um, I have gauged from you know talking to a lot of um, you know people during my field work, where a lot of people attested to the fact that you know they subscribe to uh, you know the three journals, and these were considered kind of you know essential in every home in North India. I'm going to now talk of the style, form, and content of uh, the journal, specifically Shama. So Shama was one of the most popular Urdu film journal, as I said, and included literary columns that contained short stories and poems. The literary columns ensured that the ambit of its readership was varied and diverse. Other Urdu film journals like Star and Nigar Khana had their share of Adabi or literary content as well. Other, um, so in 1946, uh, the annual Shama, which was a special issue, uh, an Eid number, contained a total of 45 stories, poems, puzzles, and the rest of the issue was then dedicated to film and critical pieces, and there were advertisements of films and other sundry commodities. Um, the size of this particular issue was large format, which was approximately 270 pages. Um, and in the editorial, Dehelvi elaborated on the process of selection of Adubi stories and poems uh, by dividing the writers into two categories. And he talks about these two categories as established writers and new writers. So very much like a literary magazine, the film journal was another avenue for young poets and writers to get their materials published. Um, they have been claimed that uh, Shama was the right platform for these new writers and that they would gain success and privilege after publication in the magazine. And in fact, in later issues in Shama um, would feature writers, Urdu progressive writers, such as Isma Chittai, uh, Rajendra Singh Bedi, among others. Uh, so these mediated and structured transactions between literary and film journals provided endless possibilities for struggling writers and lyricists in the film industry, thereby enabling the continued and persistent influence of an Urdu imaginary on film culture. Another example where film journals incorporated and mimicked uh, literary journals was a column called Mushahidat or Observations in the journal Star, which was edited by Amar Jalalabadi, the lyricist and poet. Um, and this particular column was written very much in the style of contemporary literary columns, which focused on poets and poetic islah or correction. Um, in a particular issue that I looked at from the 1940s, um, Jalalabadi wrote about his meeting with the controversial poet uh, Yagana Chengezi in Bhopal. And I'm not going to go too much into the details of this particular article, but this is an example to show you how um, very much similar to a similar article that appeared in the literary magazine called Zamana, from 1938, where um, the author Mulkram uh, critically engaged with um, Yagana's poetry as well. So one can see that Jalalabadi in the film magazine was clearly engaging with an ongoing contemporary literary debate on poetic merit. And these overlaps between the literary and film culture draws our attention to the ways in which the Urdu public sphere informed film, film culture in print in this period. And allowing a lot of these um, editors to kind of in, experiment with formats. And it also, you know, kind of is very exciting to see that, you know, what all can be included within something that is just considered as a film magazine. So there's a kind of huge experimentation that's going on in this period. Um, well, of course, it is difficult to assess the average proportion of, you know, or the exact proportion of, you know, filmy versus literary material in Urdu film magazines, because there is such a dearth of um, issues that are available or well archived uh, from the early period. 
However, based on the few issues that I have looked at from the 30s and 40s, and then you know, looking at particularly at Shama from 60s to the 80s, uh, I can confidently say that the inclusion of stories, poems, and ghazals of varying lengths formed an important part of the journal. Um, and this made Shama quite distinct from many of its contemporary journals like Film India, Rangbhumi, etc. cetera. Uh, the columns that appeared in Shama changed over the years, but a few persisted up to the 90s. Uh, the section on film was called the Filmi Makale or the film articles. Uh, this section contained the Filmi Tapsara or the film review which regularly analyzed contemporary films and their techniques. Um, in the writing of early reviewers, the analysis of film was mostly focused on processes of narrativization, plot construction, and methods borrowed from literary criticism, focusing on semantic and stylistic aspects of dialogues and lyrics. However, as film criticism, evolved a new language, the shifts in writing in the Urdu film journal become evident. Um, in an article, uh, Ishad Chuktai writes about the role of filmmakers and directors in creating meaningful realistic cinema and reflects on the need to create parameters for judging films which were not merely formal and technical, but also theoretical. Uh, he, stress, he stressed, sorry, uh, the need for a theory for film criticism. And he writes, and I quote, the most important issue for film today is to bring film criticism to the common view at the level of theory and to make such criticism a tradition, end quote. Texts such as these were bringing their knowledge of the literary traditions embedded within the Urdu public sphere, but intervening within an existing corpus of writing on cinema. The film review column in the journal Nigar Khana had an interesting rating system or you know, a scorecard of sorts, um, where each film was judged on the basis of direction, story, music, dialogues, and even acting. Um, these mark sheets created new parameters for film criticism and review. For example, here acting or performance becomes a new category for analysis and criticism. And I think there is a kind of link with the proliferating um, you know, acting manuals and theories of acting in Urdu that are kind of circulating in the Urdu public sphere and those you know, influencing this particular kind of mode of uh, film criticism. Um, another column that um, regularly appeared in Shama was a kind of studio news column called Producer or Director Kya Kar Rahe Hai, or What Are the Producers and Directors Doing? This was a similar column to um, you know, other studio news columns in different magazines like Film India and um, you know, Star, Chitrapat, etc. But unlike you know, the other journals, um, this particular column was not divided under different studio headings, but had these very sensational titles that involved salacious wordplay and, um, you know, with the film titles. So here are some examples, for example, uh, where, um, you know, the studio news was divided as um, Nargis Ka Rumal or Nargis's Handkerchief and the name of the film is Rumal or Munawar Sultana, Pyar Ki Manzil Mein, Munawar Sultana, On the Road of Love, and the name of the film is Pyar Ki Manzil Mein, and so on and so forth. So it's such interesting titles and, you know, uh, interesting way of segmenting particular columns. Um, these plumped into the contemporary star discourses by titillating readers um, and exciting their interest, but the promise for salacious gossip was very quickly thwarted by mundane news about the progress of studios and production of particular films. A column which was a regular feature in Shama was Ye Filmistan Hai, or This is the Film World by the author Bhari Bhartwa. Um, Bhari Bhartwa is literally translated as heavyweight. These were authored by Yusuf Dehelvi, and his use of the pseudonym 
allowed for flexibility and validated claims of Bela Tatsara or you know, unbiased analysis. This column is comparable to Film India's regular feature, Bombay Calling, which in the word of the editor, Baburao Patel, was, and I quote, the monopoly of Judas, and he writes what he likes and about things which he likes, and so on and so forth. Um, so the similarities between the two columns are obvious in the ways both lay emphasis on the use of pseudonym of, for the author, the gender as male, his physical weight, as well as his unrestricted words. Often readers wrote to Shama to ask about the identity of the author. And they would ask, and I quote, Janab, ye to bataye, ye bhari bharkam sahab kaun hai? Sir, who is this Mr. Bhari Bharkam? End quote. In a typically evasive and witty remark, Dehelvi would write back, Wo hain, jo bhari bharkam hain. It is the one who is a heavyweight. End quote. The column provided a hilarious take on celebrities, often putting them into imaginary or unreal scenarios. For example, in a particular section, for on freelancing as a prelude to destruction, um, Bhari Bharkam mocks Noor Jaha for working in multiple productions and studios at the same time. And there are a lot of uh, you know, interesting ways in which Bhari Bharkam constantly takes digs at you know, the stars and directors. Um, when comparisons are drawn between the two issues of Shama and Film India from the same year, 1946, the difference in tone and content becomes ever more apparent. Bhari Bharkam's content was predominantly salacious gossip and jibes at film stars and directors through a very innovative use of Urdu flourishes and poetic metaphors. While Bhari Bharkam's tone was mockery and witty tons of satire, Judas's tone was authoritative and assertive, very much in line with uh, Film India's style in this period. Um, in his column, uh, Judas would address the government's restriction on raw footage, um, campaigned against foreign films like Gangadin, which was seen as slandering Indians, but also he would, you know, routinely take jibes at actors and actresses. So there, there is a similarity. Um, in Shama, the sort of these more serious topics related to film censorship and film production code and other aspects of film business were relegated to the editorial column, which aimed to, I guess, in a very direct way, influence the uh, policy around film and also, in some sense, maintain uh, use of the healthy, you know, authoritative voice. And so they made this kind of distinction between the two, you know, columns as the editorial as a certain kind of voice and Bhari Bharkam, a very different kind of tone. Um, the mass head of Shama from the 1946 annual summarizes the essence and the public address of the journey poetically. It reads, um, and I'm going to share this, beloved of millions of youth, a unique quality monthly, which persistently with wit and irony and good intentions brings interesting new articles on films, beautiful evergreen instructive stories, bewitching puzzles, tunes, unbiased reviews of film, fun-filled film-related questions and answers, a variety of pictures of film faces and other exhilarating treasures all published regularly." End quote. Some basic assumptions can be gleaned from observing the language and intent of the market which points to the kind of nuanced process through which Shama differentiated itself from other contemporary film journals. The masshead also provides a sense of the motley mix of genres which drew readers to the world of Shama. Dehelvi's use of poetic Urdu Ladin with Persian flourishes and the insistence on Sabak Amos Apsani or the instructive story brings Shama closer to Urdu journals of its time, like uh, Nerangi Khayal and Adib, among others. These attempts at mirroring the format of contemporary literary journals that try to present stories of Islam or reform placed Shama within the Urdu literary public sphere and gave a push to its claim for legitimacy, self-worth, and respectability. 
However, the film's content was the other significant part of the attraction. And this oscillation between filmy titillation and isla is what creates an important bridge between the two worlds that were often imagined as distinct, but presented as a whole in Shama. In the next section, I'm going to be talking about Aklaq in Isla in the Urdu film journal, specifically Shama um, and film stage. So the discourse of improvement and reform were central impulses of the late 19th and early 20th century. The Urdu public sphere had a long-standing engagement with discussions on Aklaq, ethical conduct and Islam reform. Muzaffar Alam has highlighted that Aklaq texts were chiefly concerned with providing a philosophical, non-sectarian and humane solution to emergent problems encountered by Indian society. While Aklaq texts had their beginnings in a tradition of dissent, they were gradually integrated within the elite discourses on jurisprudence and practical philosophy as highlighted by Alam. It is beyond the purview of this talk to map the historical transformation of the Aklaq text. But suffices to say that uh, these texts were more than mere digests of norms of individual good behavior and ethics. These texts were intended to articulate and transmit what ought to constitute correct conduct and action in varying socio-political contexts. The Aklaq texts were uh, in circulation in the early 20th century were addressing the encounter with colonial modernity in new and novel ways. It is not surprising that Urdu film journals too were preoccupied in this discussion on Aklaq and Isla emerging from the Urdu public sphere in relation to the modernizing impulse of cinema. The paradoxical place of cinema continued to embody the tension between the commodification of culture and articulations of ethical and moral selfhood in Urdu film journals. Urdu film journalists felt that they had an important role to play in purging the perception of cinema as a den of bad morals and a base, shameless profession. They urged filmmakers to strengthen their commitment to reform as Qaumi Khidma, uh, service to the nation. And this kind of, you know, is constantly referred to in many of the articles that I've gone through where, you know, um, they urge filmmakers to make films which are seen as a service to the nation. Um, in an article, Film Ka Asar Aflaq Par, The Effect of Film on Ethical Conduct by Khalilur Rahman, um, Rahman argued that uh, cinephilia was a modern impulse and film viewing had become part of the weekly activities of the young. His views resonated with contemporary writings on uh, ethical conduct and film consumption. In light of the ubiquitous presence of cinema, Rahman believed that film journalists had an important job of publishing useful articles, which would lead to the moral correction and reform of the industry. He believed that some artists, directors, and film owners promoted films that destroyed the modest and ethical conduct of the nation. The limitless desire, or behad shock, as he referred to, for cinema necessitated the production of films that would lead to the transformation of the form. Uh, Rahman's article argued that cinema had radical potential for change and repeatedly urged filmmakers to avoid making films. Sarah, if you could unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Did I get shut off from the menu? Some... Yes, you did. Don't worry. I mean, you can start again. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, 
Uh, should I just scan, uh, share my screen again? So, sorry about that. So I have kind of, you have to prompt me as to where I got cut off because I was just on this you know, speaking mode and I didn't notice being cut off. Um, did I start talking about, did we follow to um, the article? Uh, did, I, did I manage to get in some points about Khalilur Rahman's argument about Sumatilia? Yes, you, you did. Um, just a couple of sentences, if you could re repeat them, that would be fine. Yeah, okay. uh, so the limitless desire or behad shock for cinema necessita necessitated the production of films that would lead to the transformation of the form or the community or the nation. Uh, Rahman's article urged the cinema, argue, sorry, the, Rahman's article argued that cinema had radical potential for change and repeatedly urged filmmakers to avoid making films that would lead to the destruction of future generations. And very interestingly, two areas that, um, you know, according to him needed immediate attention of reformers and film uh, producers were romance and comedy. Um, critical of uh, contemporary trends in cinema and theater that focused on outdated uh, versions of romance Rahman declared that while romance was a great part of human life and was not necessarily bad, but romantic scenes in film he considered were infused, uh, must be infused with uh, tehzeeb or culture and shayastagi, civilized purity. Um, genres such as the social, devotional film and the historical were considered to nicely lent to this Aflaki enterprise that, you know, a lot of these uh, writers are promoting, specifically Rahman is promoting. Um, he specifically targets films like, you know, the Oriental fantasy genre, uh, a film like Zarina by Ezra Mir from 1932 and calls it, you know, baseless and useless and, you know, says that it's completely erasing the decorum uh, in society and, you know, there's no social propriety in the film. Um, and in contrast, um, he's all praise of a Bengali devotional um, film like Chandidas by, you know, Devaki Kumar Bose from 1932. So it's very interesting, you know, the films that become part of this, um, you know, Aflaki enterprise almost. Um, the concern with Aflaq and Islam cinema extended to the portrayal of wit and humor in film. Rahman wrote that comic scenes in contemporary cinema were inferior and of low grade. Comparing Indian films with foreign uh, films, and here specifically European and American films, he argued that most comic stars in the West infuse their acting with innovation, novelty, and mischief. Meanwhile, Indian comedians considered badakhlaqi or incivility as wit and humor. And it's very interesting how, you know, the corporeality of comedy uh, barely fit into the framework of tehzeeb or culture that, you know, the Udupan journalists are formulating within the Akhlaqi tradition. Um, so the need for reform of comedy from badakhlaqi to good moral humor was particularly crucial in relation to consumption of films and the kind of harmful effects that were assumed to you know, um, the film was supposed to have on women and children. Um, and of course, this is the period when, you know, film audiences are also getting very diverse and expanding. Uh, the anxieties about the effects of cinema on spectators were articulated in many contemporary film journals. So this is not specific to the film journals, of course. Um, the homogenized perceptions about, you know, cinema going public as uncouth, uncivilized masses, were recurrently referenced as Chavani class or, you know, the Forana class and things like that. And, and you know, they, there's constant discussion about their, you know, need to give in part Akhlaqi teaching and, you know, reform them and all of that. So um, within the Akhlaqi framework, according to Rahman, and I quote, the role of cinema was to enable the pro progress of the nation. Their film viewing instilled notions of courage, bravery, conviction, 
firmness of mind, perseverance, affection, kind-heartedness, sacrifice, selflessness, self-respect, bravery, devotion, mercy, compassion, purity, chastity, and modesty, end quote. And such a long, you know, order of demands. Uh, <laughs> these uh, fetishized ideas of empowerment were thought to be attainable through the disciplinary efforts that valorized mental strength, um, considered crucial for the formation of the eth ethical individual. The Urdu film journalists believed that a Flaki film, if there was you know, such a genre, would emancipate the people or the Akhwam and propel the nation and the community to emerge out of its current state of despair under colonial rule. These new improved ethical viewers would then contribute to the progress of the nation and create possibilities for India to compete with other developed nations of the world. The Urdu film journals explored these ideas of nation building and ethical citizenship, which were crucially tied together neatly through the wider discourse of Aklaq and Isla in relationship to cinema. Um, apart from these, you know, very didactic and very straightforward, uh, you know, articles that promote Aklaq and Isla of cinema, a very creative and sort of tangential almost strategy through which the discourses of Aklaq and Isla were promoted was in a column called Ishq e Khutut or Letters of Love which appeared in Shama quite regularly. Um, and so um, there was a note that kind of, you know, preceded the, this column, which said that, uh, and I quote, mentioned below are letters collected from the letterbox of film actresses. These letters are not merely published for fun. The grand motive is to reform. The, act, the acts of those misled youths and fans of actresses through trees of their own actions. The published love letters of actresses were written in an old fashioned style that authors in Shama were otherwise wary of and critiqued for their use of hackneyed and archaic romantic jargon. Um, amorously signed off by love struck fans with, you know, things like Aapka Rumani Premi, your romantic lover, or Tumhare Husnita Sodai, crazy about your beauty, um, from addresses in Delhi, Kanpur, Lahore, Aligarh, these letters can be placed within the longer tradition of epistolary exchange between lovers in Urdu literary culture. Uh, the publication of these letters made the Urdu film journal spaces of excess and titillation and romantic digression. The balance had to be struck between two sort of, you know, putatively opposing modes of behavioral urges. Contemporary film journals created innovative content to address and feed into the excitement and curiosity generated by modern women on screen. The actress was the site of desire and anxiety. Shama's attempts to present titillating material in the garb of Akhlaq uh, texts as tools for Isla was a masterstroke. The column was popular as can be gleaned from the letters to the editor in the, in the different issues of Shama, where readers made inquiries as to how the Hildi had access to the letters of the actresses. Um, they asked how these letters came to Shama or did the Hildi procure them directly from the actresses and to which, you know, the Hildi very, you know, um, cleverly would give very vague replies, thereby, you know, leaving a lot to the readers digression discretion and you know uh, imagination um, so despite the desire to instill good akhlaq and to reform the wayward youth the urdu film journals was full of images um, and imag imaginary scenarios of love and romance from the poetry to the letters to the artwork the journals had a particular visual vocabulary, even though limited in the early period to hand-drawn illustrations and very few images, um, which are very amorous and erotic. And of course, you know, the later issues, um, there are a lot more photographs. And um, in the sort of, you know, 60s and 70s, um, 
use of their being self is in a lot of these photographs, you know, interacting with the stars. There are in, uh, photographs of, um, you know, star weddings and marriages. And, and so it's a very interesting, um, you know, um, visual um, aesthetic and vocabulary in the later period. But the early period is very much, um, you know, hand-drawn and uh, beautiful illustrations and then studio portraits and more sort of, um, you know, portraits uh, of actresses and things like that. Um, the cover page of the 1946 Shama Annual uh, was designed by Shafiq Ahmed. Um, the hand illustrated design depicts a couple entwined in a loving embrace, presenting the proverbial moth to the flame. Um, already implied by the very title of the journal, that is Shama, which is light. The woman's body in a translucent garment emerges out of the lamp the ardor's flame of passion, the, while the man with a kind of, you know, diaphanous wings um, envelops the woman in an irresistible caress. This image was a reference and ode to the readers of Shama, um, who were lovingly called as Parvane. And it is interesting, but not surprising, that the journal Shama was depicted as female and the fan of the readers as male. And I'm just going to uh, conclude. Um, so in conclusion, um, this encounter between the Urdu public sphere and the cinema was significant in encouraging a readership of Urdu film journals that showed significant overlaps between the literary and the film. Campaigning over the Islam of films and their audiences through a fluffy framework allowed Urdu film journalists to define and refine their role as film critics with a literary conscience. Many of the Urdu journals, by incorporating literary genres, expanded the reach of cinema and brought new entanglements of cinema with the literary. Yusuf Dehelvi's Shama or Amar Jalalabadi's Star or even Film Stage uh, the successful formats that incorporated literary genres uh, such as the short story, the Afsana, uh, ghazal, poetry, etc., Urdu drama as well, with film reviews, um, film criticism, advertisements. Thus, in their style, format, and address, they attempted to emulate literary journals, but content related to cinema needed new strategies of engagement. The creative use of Urdu language in Shama or even in Star for the presentation of film material added to these journals' uniqueness. The wide spectrum of their address and varying tones produced inherent tensions between the project of Akla and Isla and the titillations and salacious gossip with which it holds. Thank you. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that fascinating presentation. Um, and without wasting much time, I would like to welcome Professor Iftikhar Dadi. Uh, to have a discussion with Sarah, after which we'll open it up for questions. But if the audience would like to put in their questions, uh, please use the Q&A box and the chat box to do so. Uh, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no. Uh, first of all, thanks so much, Sarah. This is, this is a great work, exciting research and uh, uh, very informative and uh, kind of uh, talk, which has actually um, got me thinking along a, a lot of, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, questions. Uh, so one thing, I mean, I had a number of points I wanted to just touch on. One is, of course, the the state of archives and you know the 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 the, the difficulty of kind of in a sense finding this material and uh, which you kind of which is not the main central point of your talk, but I think it's still bear, uh, worth uh, kind of stressing the that uh, it's not easy to do research simply because a lot of the material is uh, it's hard to find or unavailable and uh, um, and uh, you know there were there were uh, you know even the number the, the titles of magazines and their issues and their copies are are not easy to find and uh, i mean in this respect uh, you know as uh, as we were speaking that uh, shama was also published uh, uh, you know um, in karachi uh, after uh, after after the partition and um, and uh, I just, uh, I don't know if I can share the screen just for a bit uh, and uh, show the um, cover of Shama. 
is uh, here. Yes. Uh, uh, can you see the? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this is the this is the Shama from 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 Karachi, and uh, it uh, this is from 1958, and uh, you know there are some inside pages that, uh, and in the beginning they cover basically um, uh, they cover um, a film news, in, which includes actually interestingly kind of notes on uh, cinema both in Lahore as well and and Karachi as well as in Bombay, right? So mm -hmm. in, in you know so the news is all mixed uh, you know together, okay? So. So, uh, so one thing that I think that uh, one can think about the Urdu, um, your title was the Urdu kind of uh, sphere. What was that word you used? Uh, huh? Urdu public sphere. Yeah, the Urdu public sphere also spills across borders and you know moves across wherever the reading public is, including land and you know maybe parts of Africa where people were settled and were reading. Urdu. So that's I think one one point to note. Uh, the other is that uh, I just wanted to show. This um, this is a report which was done in Pakistan in the early 60s on the state. It was a fact finding report on cinema, and uh, these are all the titles that you know are. Uh, so these are uh, titles published from Karachi, Lahore, uh, Lyalpur, Peshawar, Quetta, Rawalpindi, Dhaka. You know, and then you have the weeklies, then you have the fortnightlies, and um, also you have um, uh, you have the monthlies. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and I mean, like, you know, apart from one or two of these titles, a lot of these are totally, uh, you know, I mean, I have not been able to find any of them. Okay, so, so I think the, the question of, um, I think this is important to underscore, because the question of uh, uh, the materials, we, I mean, Shama was obviously the most prom Shama, De you know, from Delhi was a very prominent film magazine, but then there were, there would have been lesser versions, you know, of magazines published from not just Delhi, but from all sorts of places, and uh, and uh, so so a lot of the history that uh, that we want to recover is uh, is it faces this uh, impasse. Okay, so so that would be one thing. Um, uh, regarding your point, uh, your your main argument that has to do with the question of uh, akhlaq texts and reform, I think that's very compelling. And of course, Muzaffar Alam has worked on, you know, akhlaq, Pers Persianate kind of akhlaq texts, but then other people have also since carried that in uh, in terms of the reform movements that are, you know, from the 19th century onwards. Uh, uh, in the case of cinema, um, uh, uh, one thing that, uh, one argument that uh, that Ravi Vasudevan makes actually is uh, on the uh, the, uh, the so-called Muslim social film, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I have some notes here. I just wanted to read those. Uh, uh, so, um, so he's, he's what he calls the Muslim social film genre, which, you know, he, uh, the period he's looking at is from 1935 to 1945, uh, that decade. And uh, this developed in both Lahore and Bombay, you know, and, uh, and what he argues is that this rose uh, as a response to increasing communalization in India, right? And uh, partly as a result of Muslim filmmakers countering the denigration of the Muslim community, which was seen as socially backward. And before this period, the social film primarily evoked the world of bourgeois Hindu, Hindus and the dilemmas of reform in that universe, right? In other words, that, the, that, that, that reform, social reform in cinema occurs earlier, uh, you know, where it takes up Hindu subjects, right? Hindu families, okay? And, uh, and partly the critique uh, that arises against Muslims uh, due to increasing communalization is that Muslims are effete and corrupt, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so I wonder if that's an argument that makes, you know, is uh, somehow ties into your, uh, I mean, you don't bring in the Muslim social. So I don't know how, how, how much the category of Muslim social is important for your analysis of akhlaq, okay? So that's a question that I'm asking. And uh, so let me just uh, read a little bit more. So just my notes that uh, Muslims had been depicted in commercial cinema as living in the in the in the past in kind of historical stasis and preoccupied with de 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 decadent and elite kind of nawabi you know kind of pastimes right and um, or they were uh, uh, other genres based on Arabian Nights themes and Oriental fantasies and pissas and dastans and so on right and uh, and partly then. Uh, and what Ravi Vasudevan makes the observations that films deploying, and I quote the 
Pan the Punjab and Urdu narrative and performance culture it generated was part of a larger territory that went beyond the subcontinent. Um, so that would also, you know, if one wants to think about the circulation of cinema also as not just the film magazines, but the film magazines would make sense in relation to somehow people who are viewers of the, of the cinema, then how do we think about those circulations? And, um, and uh, so, the, so, so when this Muslim social emerges and grapples centrally with questions of reform and modernity in kind of Muslim communities, and, uh, and you know, he talks about films like Najma, which was 1943, Mehboob Khan, Ilan also 1948, which is Mahmoud Khan, Qaidi uh, 1941 by S.F. Hasnain, Masoom by also S.F. Hasnain 1942, right? So, um, so in other words, um, you don't make the argument in terms of your, uh, your, the, 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 your argument about um, akhlaq uh, as one of the, let's say modalities that the film journal um, articulates. But I wonder if the two can be you know, brought into conversation. Okay, so that's a, um, uh, that's a concern. Another concern is the relation between, let's say, the high and the low. Okay, <laughs> to put it kind of crudely, and uh, I mean the film. I mean, you know, Urdu at you know during the from the thirties, you know, onwards would be. Uh, I mean, they were very. Uh, you know, uh, this is the age of journals, right? And uh, and uh, you know, kind of elite literary journals that are catering to to well-established authors, right? Um, and um, whereas the film journal, as you, you noted that in Shama, there were some prominent authors like Rajinder Sid and Bedi and so on who published, but primarily this is not the platform for, uh, for established and well-recognized uh, writers, right? Um, and um, you also mentioned uh, in your talk about uh, the the need to reform the what is it the do paise wale or what was the term you Javani used? Javani class. So. class. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so what's the what's the role of kind of let's say the question of class of genre? Okay, of the question of um, of of high literary value that is associated with kind of let's say uh, uh, a way of looking at the world that would be more akhlaqi. Okay, to put it that way, vis-a-vis -vis the film journal that is trying to in a sense straddle both. You know. Uh, right. Um, and the fourth thing about the akhlaq uh, argument is that um, uh, so if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to really uh, read, become a morally better person, you would read an akhlaq text, right? I, I mean, this is the kind of the a tongue in cheek car, tongue counter argument I'm making, right? So if the reason you go and read a film journal is because you don't care actually about being, you know, becoming reformed, you want to have fun. Okay, so so what to what degree do you want to hold on to? In other words, are both things possible in the film journal? Are they in tension with each other? You know, so yeah. perhaps that's also something that uh, perhaps if you could speak more to, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. Um, so um, I'm going to begin with the archive question because um, you know that's something that um, you know I also grappled with a lot when I began the search, uh, the research and. Um, you know, initially when I started out, uh, you know, my research, I was only looking for Shama and that was the sort of only popular journal that I had heard of. Um, and then when I sort of, you know, came to, um, you know, England and I was at the British Library and I started, you know, again, looking at the catalog of, you know, Urdu publications from the 1930s, um, I found, uh, you know, again, the similar kind of list that you showed about, you know, uh, publications from uh, Pakistan and they, there were, you know, a, more than a dozen uh, of you know titles of Urdu film magazines um, in the 30s and the 40s, um, which are completely lost to us right now. Um, and that kind of you know the, the catalog kind of you know um, spurred this kind of you know search for the magazine sort of. And I traveled to you know India and uh, you know I also went to the you know Library uh, of Congress in Washington. Uh, different libraries in the UK uh, in search of, you know, the Urdu film magazine. And it's really amazing because, um, you know, a lot of the sort of uh, archive, I mean, the film archive, for example, doesn't have a single copy in Pune 
of the film magazine, you know, the film magazine. So that was kind of a really big setback. Um, and then when I moved to, you know, um, traditional sort of, you know, uh, or official archives of Urdu material, um, you know, there was always, you know, this kind of, um, you know, absence that I kind of encountered and also like a surprise from a lot of the, you know, librarians and stuff. And they always came up with this surprise that, oh, you're looking for an Urdu film magazine, why? Uh, because, you know, the film magazine uh, was always, you know, seen as, you know, tafri or, you know, like diversion mm -hmm. or something like the, you know, you read and just throw and, you know, just get rid of. So it wasn't really, it hasn't been archived. And that is a huge, uh, you know, setback and a kind of, you know, dilemma almost for researchers when you're trying to uh, map this kind of, you know, history of the, uh, you know, film uh, culture uh, within the Urdu public sphere and what was going on in this time. Um, Having said that, um, I also encountered uh, a lot of, you know, uh, people that had memories of reading, you know, Urdu film journals from this period uh, and late, you know, later periods. And that was very interesting because, uh, you know, each came up with this very kind of, um, um, you know, very different kind of narrative about their own personal relationship to the Urdu film magazine, which was, uh, you know, not just, and which was very different from this kind of, you know, aklahi, um, you know, morality that the film magazine is trying to project to its readers while the readers themselves have a very different memory and attachment to uh, the film magazine as a material object um, and an object of, you know, of, of film. Um, yeah. um, so then uh, coming to, you know, uh, the idea about, you know, the, the Muslim social and, um, you know, um, so, a lot of the, uh, you know, my uh, engagement with, uh, you know, the, the issues around Aflaq are, you know, coming from how, you know, a lot of the Urdu journalists in this particular presentation, how the Urdu journalists are looking at these ideas of reform of cinema and, you know, incorporating Aflaq texts and ideas and discourses of Aflaq within, um, you know, um, within the ambit of film. Uh, and what is very interesting is that actually in a lot of the texts that I looked at, the articles, the columns, um, the Muslim social as a specific category was not discussed. It was always, you know, social as a genre, uh, you know, which was seen as, you know, a, you know, a kind of viable genre for a fluffy film. Uh, and, uh, you know, genres such as the historical um, and, you know, devotional films, these were the genres that a lot of the, uh, you know, our journalists would talk about and would see as, you know, you know, films that were promoting good Afla. So there was not that kind of differentiation between, you know, the social, the, uh, you know, the, and the Muslim social in that sense, at least in some of the journals um, and the articles that I looked at. Mm -hmm. But it would be very interesting to see, you know, how um, Afla, I think, um, may have been, you know, sort of uh, mobilized within the sort of, um, you know, um, imaginary of the Muslim social, for example. And of course, the Muslim social, I think, you know, it kind of really distills a lot of the, you know, cosmopolitanism of Urdu in general. So um, I think it would be um, uh, kind of very interesting to see because a lot of the journals um, in this period, uh, you know, are also uh, trying to, you know, present the, you know, the world of Urdu as, you know, something which is cosmopolitan and, uh, you know, which is not, uh, there are also a lot of language debates in the Urdu film journal, which I obviously didn't have time to present, but in the, you know, uh, in the journals, they're constantly talking about, you know, communal harmony and, you know, um, how, you know, Urdu um, is the language of cinema. And so there's this kind of trust, um, which is trying to move away from uh, the impulse of, you know, kind of very isolated Muslim social world. Yeah, yeah. And to look at the Akhlaq more in broader terms as a kind of, you know, um, almost, um, you know, looking at both, um, you know, texts such as Chandi Das, for example, which is about a devotional, um, you know, saint. And so it's kind of quite varied, the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, you know, the high and the low and um, the kind of authors that um, Shama particularly, uh, you know, commissioned, I think that um, at least in the early period, while it was still trying to establish itself, there were kind of newer writers, but um, 
over the period of you know 60s 70s and 80s i've seen like some of the you know really important so called highbrow literary writers actually you know publishing in shama and mm. there was this kind of consensus that if there was any film journal that you could you know uh, see as you know uh, as you know respectable was shama so there was this kind of you know um shama was almost at the you know edge of the you know uh, low and high um, mm -hmm. high i think um so is that a, do you see that as a trajectory or do you, i mean it was not always like that that yeah, it, it 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 becomes more yeah. a platform for more serious writing in the later years is that yeah. what you're saying Absolutely. okay yeah, yeah. Okay. I think it's also like you know it's very interesting because when you see the 1946 issue, of course I don't have you know early issues like I don't have the first issue from 1930, mm. unfortunately. But um, if, if you see the 1946 issue, you uh, you know in the editorial you see how the whole sort of you know um, like uh, the way it is um, you know the the bifurcation between established writers and you know um, emerging writers is presented by the Hindi as a kind of you know. Um, that look here is this kind of you know literary flash film journal which is going to you know uh, present certain kinds of um, you know writing um, mm. in a film film journal format mm. so good uh, <laughs> um yeah and regarding like the question of fun versus like being reformed right so yeah, 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 yeah. okay yeah. I think there's uh, there's all uh, that there is that tension, you know, that is quite visible yeah. even in the film journal, you know, like the letters to, um, you know, editor, but also in the love letters of the actresses, you know, there is that tension where, uh, you they they present film material which is, you know, very, um, you know, there is all kind of, you know, romantic love being professed to actresses. However, there's, you know, there is this commentary which is supposed to, you know, tame your urges and, you know, your instinct so um there is that kind of you know tug uh, and push and pull that's happening in terms of you know these different urges that a film magazine is supposed to um you know evoke in a reader mm -hmm. and that i think is the exciting part of the film magazine um sara and iftikhar we have a few questions uh, so should we start taking them i think we have well we have half an hour to um for sara to answer the question so i'll start taking them in order the first one is from marcus um how do you evaluate the persistence of moralism here a clock as an excuse for indulging desires that don't fit in with bourgeois expectation expectations of self improvement or the dominant interest or unreconciled urges yeah i think it's uh, it's something that you know um quite interesting because um there is um this um you know tug as i said before you know between these two different urges where you know there's this emphasis uh, constantly on you know um you know being this moral and ethical subject and the film viewer need uh, in need of you know reform and kind of you know trying to tame um the audiences however you know as and when you see the journal and the way it is structured there's so much you know salacious gossip um so um i think there is this kind of you know expectation uh, that is set out by these you know bourgeois elite writers um which then don't i uh, you know conform to the expectations of the readers and so there are these you know definitely un uh, you know um reconciled urges um i believe i don't know if that answers um the question thanks sara um the next question is from trinankur banerji he says thank you for your talk it was really illuminating i was wondering if you came across anything on the muslim comedians like uh, noor mohammad chali ghori at all uh, who were a major part of pre independence bombay cinema and migrated to pakistan after partition um so um i mean there were there are images for example of um, you know 
um, gory and um, there are also uh, you know film stills and things like that but there's not specifically any um, you know in a lot of these aflaki texts you know uh, which are trying to talk of you know wit and humor there's a very kind of generic way of you know talking of comedy so there's not specific examples that they draw on um there what i also found was that there is a kind of you know uh, eurocentricism and a kind of very heavy reliance on american cinema as you know seen as a kind of model cinema and so there's a kind of comparison which is being made between indian cinema to the american and the european uh, comedy comedy scene and so um um you know charlie chaplin is referenced a couple of times in these uh, as you know and it's very interesting because charlie chaplin you know in the early part of his career was not seen as somebody who was you know um respectable humor and it was only later that he becomes like that so it's kind of interesting how the you know in the old film magazine in this period that actually um indian comedians are generically quite dismissed so uh, yeah i i don't think there's any specific reference to them but there there were like you know some photographs and you know um studio uh, sorry film stills uh, where they are thanks sara uh next we have two questions from afroz taj uh do you want me to read out both of them together or uh, one maybe one at a time yeah okay the first one is did the social messages of shama etc change after independence and if so how that's the first question okay so um i mean social messages um in what context i mean specifically what does you know a social message i'm i'm kind of unclear about what that means but if um you mean um you know the way in which the aflaq uh you know ideas around aflaq and this love cinema were framed i think that kind of uh persists uh even later on um in the later issues where you know there is an emphasis on reform and uh you know constantly uh seeing that the role of the film journalist is to intervene within you know what is happening in the you know in film business and film production and constantly uh strive for improvement so that pretty much remains the same of course the context changes um post partition um there's also this whole impulse to um uh you know there there are a lot of articles in the later issues that post independence that are talking of you know communal harmony and um talking of you know um amity between the two countries and promoting films that are you know um more sort of secular in their impulse and last yeah. and the next question uh from afroz is when did shama begin to recognize that the indian and pakistani film industries were two separate entities because in the issue of karachi uh, shama that iftikhar sahab showed the two industries were still perceived as together in some sense um i think this is true of not just shama but um, quite a few other uh, journals as well even film india uh, for all its you know uh, babura patel vitriol against um, you know um the emerging new country uh and you know so makers who migrated to pakistan there's still a lot of uh, you know studio news that is um looking at both countries in um up to the 50s i think uh but yeah i mean and then of course it all changes and there's um you know i i haven't really looked at for the specific uh you know thing so i can't really comment when it ends but yeah i've seen some you know in the 50s there's still um you know uh shama as well as other film journals where you know lahore um i mean lahore i don't think was really uh you know in a shape to you know produce films at that time but there is this kind of you know discussion about noor jahan for example um who is mm-hmm. uh, you know who's who's moved there so there's that kind of talk of you know film makers being uh you know in different uh, moving to different um you know cities in lahore and karachi yeah i mean the bombay film industry was far bigger than yeah. you know and lahore was kind of shattered because of yeah. uh, because the the studio owners were you know they left 
and um, so there was this kind of uh, and so I mean in the sense that the the you know the Pakistani magazines would I mean you know the the presence of Indian films in the Pakistani imagination was far bigger than vice versa probably you know <laughs> I would yeah. I would you know surmise but uh, Salma Siddiqui has done work on yeah, yeah, yeah. you know the early exchanges between yeah, yeah. I mean, um, even in uh, Salma's work, you know, she talks about, you know, how, um, you know, the way in which, uh, you know, uh, Barbara Patel specifically, Film India, you know, discusses a lot of the, you know, uh, this migration of, um, you know, filmmakers to, um, you know, Lahore, and there's this kind of really um, vitriolic way in which um, Barbara Patel in Film India is discussing uh, this kind of migration. But there is also, um, I think, a lot of, uh, we, you know, kind of still, there's a lot of nostalgia as well in some of these journals about this kind of loss of Lahore. And um, yeah. Yes, we have uh, quite a few questions actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're coming in. Um, the next question is from. Soheb Niyazi, uh, how does the Urdu film journal compare with journals in Hindi and other major regional language journals that had a regional film industry? Why does the Indian literary authors, and for that matter, in most post-colonial contexts, cinema as a medium of entertainment and education is welcomed, while in the European context is treated with suspicion for being a popular mass cultural media that had the potential to vulgarize art and culture. For instance, the term boy in Bangla means both the book and a film. Film by Tagore was considered as Ruper Cholut Prabaho, meaning movement of beauteous forms. How does one understand the role of the Urdu film journal in the light of these dichotomous tendencies? But I think, I mean, I would say that even this is, uh, I mean, this is, I mean, European cinema is not one thing, right? In the, that you have the auteurs and you have, you know, you have, you know, kind of serious criticism written from very early on. So, mm -hmm. so I would not say that all European or Western cinema was seen as necessarily degrading. Okay. So, I mean, I think one would have to differentiate genres and so on. I mean, there's the Frankfurt School culture industry argument, you know, but that, um, uh, that uh, you know one, one wouldn't uh, but that would have to do with uh, certain genres and commercial cinema and so on one wouldn't i think uh, want to characterize all european cinema in one in with the same uh with with, with the with the same uh, set of values associated with it i mean in terms of like comparing uh, the urdu film journals with you know hindi or even you know other journals um so I mean, because of my sort of very limited uh, language expertise, um, I've only looked at, you know, Hindi journals um, like Chitrapat and also like drawing a lot from, you know, Ravi Khan's work on, um, you know, Chitrapat and other journals and Madhuri, uh, where uh, Ravi Khan also talks about, you know, how a lot of the um, Hindi journals are, um, you know, kind of um, presenting uh, film material through literary strategies. Uh, so there is that kind of, you know, similarity there in that sense. Um, um, and, uh, but, you know, I haven't looked at the Bengali magazines, unfortunately, or even the Marathi uh, magazines or the Tamil magazines. And that would be very interesting to see, you know, whether there are these kind of, you know, um, um, overlaps uh, between these different uh, languages and, um, and how the regional film industries were kind of, you know, um, I mean, we know sort of how they are kind of, uh, you know, there are these circuits and there are these, you know, interactions and constant flows of personnel from one uh, industry to another, from Calcutta uh, to Bombay and then to Lahore and from Lahore to Bombay. And so it is quite a sort of, you know, um, mobile um, industrial formation. Um, in terms of like, um, I agree with uh, Iftikhar that, you know, of course, uh, European cinema um, is not always, um, I think, not always looked as this kind of, um, you know, with suspicion, I guess, but um, because at least in some of the articles that I have looked at, there's a very interesting, you know, valorization of, you know, American cinema and certain genres, you know, of uh, American film that are seen as, you know, um, like certain, you know, um, 
you know, thrillers, for example, are you know, seen as, you know, kind of path breaking. And, you know, those are the ones that the media should, Indian filmmakers should try and make, or even the historicals um, are seen as, you know, exemplary. Um, and and this is um, this kind of valorization of American or European cinema actually is more to do with the technique of film mm -hmm. than with the you know um, with the you know uh, the content of the film or the you know the ethics and the morality within the film. So it is more about appreciation of the technique of filmmaking and the way in which you know um, their their camera work is and so on and so forth. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the next question is from Salma Siddiqui. This was great, Sarah. Thanks. Do the magazines give any sense of the journalist's proximity to the industry, especially Shama, which was published from Delhi? What's the sense of the access that Urdu journalists had had to filming and stars? First of all, hi, Salma. Thanks that you're here. Um, uh, so... I think um, in the sort of uh, journals, uh, the early period that I looked at, there's not that much sense. Um, there are these hints at, you know, um, the fact that, um, you know, in the letters to the editor, um, Yusuf Dehelvi is always, always, you know, kind of uh, trying to establish that he's very close to, um, you know, Nargis, for example, and, you know, other filmmakers. Um, and he's also, there's a lot of, you know, um, uh, you know, suggestion to the fact that he's traveling to Bombay to different studios to, you know, kind of see the production of certain films. And so there is that sense, but uh, there are no uh, photographs, which are, the photographs come at a much later stage. So in the 60s, 70s and 80s, when you look at the journal, it is full of, you know, um, uh, use of the heavy with, you know, um, you know, cohorting with like all of the stars from the period, um, you know, Dilip Kumar and Raj Kapoor and, you know, all the who's who of the film industry, he's, you know, shown photographs, uh, photographed with, um, and the journal publishes those. There's also like, you know, um, the Nikanama of, um, you know, Dilip Kumar that is published and there's this kind of, you know, um, show of the fact that, you know, he was present in, at the you know at the occasion and so he does uh, present a lot of you know uh, a, a lot of these photographs in the journal to uh, establish that he's very close to the film stars and filmmakers um, and um, I think there's also the suggestion that uh, you know film stars come to Delhi and they you know stay over at you know his bungalow in Delhi and so, but this is much later. This is not in the 40s. Uh, this happens a lot later. Um, the next question is from Rita Rad. Did you find any ethical conduct related to money use? Um, not any references to money, but um, in general, I think there was, um, I think there was this kind of uh, implicit, you know, suggestion that you don't talk about the salaries of, you know, actors and actresses, and that kind of was maintained pretty much in the journal, um, which, um, yeah, but I, I don't think there was any kind of you know, explicit uh, reference or kind of suggestion to money or money. Yeah, I'm not sure about the question, money. I mean, you know, there's also the you know, the, like the morality of many plots where the rich, you know, like the industrialist is corrupt, etc. Right? I mean, in a, in a sense that, uh, uh, yes. you know, there are kind of uh, narrative devices that uh, drive, uh, you know, uh, the plot yeah. that frequently are based on class, you know, like differences in kind of class where the rich are in inevitably, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, morally depraved, etc. Right? So, so is that, is that one, I mean, is that a, but they're also, in a sense, celebrated. I mean, that's what I'm saying, that one of the things uh, that uh, the, the, the argument about akhlaq, I think uh, I would urge you to temper it also with, uh, with the counter currents that actually cinema itself and it's, even its, uh, its uh, writings in the journal are doing. Because at some level, the uh, cinema is profoundly amoral, right? In the sense that even if it eventually has a moral resolution in which you have the good guys win throughout the plot is actually a celebration of, you yes. know, uh, audacious and kind of uh, amoral, uh, you know, uh, lifestyles. Okay. Yeah. 
and uh, so in in the sense how convincing is the eventually the you know the bourgeois moral ending right so so i would say that you have both things that uh, that exist very profoundly and powerfully in cinema and uh, do, do does does that find a kind of an analog in the film journal okay i mean the, i guess that's the way i would pose that my question i think it does you know in yeah. the way that we, um, you know the film journal itself is quite conflicted in the way um, you know for example a lot of film advertisements or film images uh, you know film stills are you know uh, placed in the you know in the journal um, or even you know there are all these advertisements uh, in the film journal which i didn't have time to talk about but you know it's something that i look at in my larger pieces um you know for all kinds of you know sexual health of you know men and women um you know all kinds of portions um that are being advertised and so there is this kind of you know um um excess um that uh, the film journal is becomes a space of mm. thanks sara um there is one question from so it, it's basically a set of four questions from ravi uh, and i think this will be our last one before we wrap up today so the questions are thank you for this interesting talk sara a couple of queries number 1 like baburao patel did yusuf delvi also have any direct connection with the film industry of course both of them were based in different cities yusuf being in delhi unlike baburao who was there in the film city itself did yusuf make any foray into filmmaking prior to entering film journalism can you dwell a bit upon how and what made yusuf delvi enter film journalism the second question is in the 40s we um, know that Bab should i take them in one yeah. by one okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um i'm actually not entirely sure of how he ventures into um you know film journalism but i know that there were these ancillary you know uh, business interests that he had uh, like the unani medicines and the leather works and real estate um so i don't think that he had any connection to the film industry for um the i mean i'm i'm totally up for standing you know to be corrected at this point but um in my own research i didn't come across that however um he does establish film connections you know um through his work in the film journal and um he also uh, later on in the 50s um uh, you know uh, produced uh, you know kind of two films one was bharosa from i think 1955 if i'm not wrong um and there was another film which i can't think of but you know he does he does try his hand at you know um you know producing films and um you know investing in certain studios and things like that so there's that kind of um um uh, you know expansion of his role as a film editor to different ancillary film businesses so that does happen in the later period and the next question the next question is um in the 40s we know that baburao patel through film india gradually turned rapidly anti muslim with partition leading him to make a very decisive shift in his stance what kind of shift is visible in use of delvi shama's stance um, did you find them in conversation or debate at any moment post partition um so there are very interesting you know um you know bhari bharkam the column um, you know there there's a lot of like digs at uh, you know baburao patel and you know there are lots of jibes at his you know relationships and you know there is um, so there is constant dialogue with film india and um, there are references to you know uh, the film magazine as well and the rivalries are quite obvious um but um in terms of the kind of i don't i particularly didn't see any uh, kind of you know similar shift in you know um you know a kind of you know anti hindu uh, stance in um in this of the these writings um and like i said you know there is this kind of um there's there's almost this you know desire for you know promoting communal harmony and things like that and talking about you know what a loss uh, the partition has been and things like that so there's that kind of mourning almost in some of the, mm -hmm. the uh, editorials the third question 
again from Ravi is where did Shama figure in the economics of the film journal of of the film journalism, especially in North India, in relation to Hindi film magazines? Uh, so um, okay, actually the it's very interesting, but I don't have you know the figures with me right now. But um, you know the um, circulation uh, figures of Shama from the fifties and sixties that are available to us um, actually show that it was one of the most popular film magazines, uh, like you know seventy to eighty thousand copies being sold um, in all of North India, uh, in, in all of India at this time, and um, so. Yeah, I think it was quite um, quite popular and, and was making a lot of money. Um, another way I think of gauging the economics or you know, if you have to think of what kind of money you're making, um, there was this kind of, uh, you know, the, there was a crossword uh, that Shama regularly published at the last page. And, uh, you know, the amount of money that was being, you know, uh, the prize money was sometimes, you know, in lakhs, uh, if I'm not mm. exaggerating. And, it's amazing that, you know, the amount of people that would subscribe to Shama, um, you know, also for this, um, you know, particular aspect of the magazine. And uh, in one of my interviews with, um, you, know, um, you know, a reader of Shama um, who is now in his 80s, and he specifically told me that, you know, a lot of, like in his college days, a lot of the Shama would be, you know, sold in this mutilated form. So the last page, which was the, you know, uh, the crossword would be kind of, you know, um, you know, torn off by somebody and, you know, they would use it to send it to claim their price. Um, and these mutilated copies then would be sold at a cheaper price uh, because they didn't have the, you know, crossword in them. So, you know, college students were always, you know, looking for these mutilated copies because, um, you know, they would be cheaper. So, um, yeah, so I think it was quite popular and they did fairly well um, in terms of their circulation figures. Thanks, Sarah. I don't think we have time for the last question from Ravi, but I'm happy to read it out to you if you would like. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so the last question from him is, finally, can you say something about the readership of Shama? Do you think it would be appropriate to say that by the 40s, Urdu public sphere had actually predominantly become Muslim public uh, sp sphere. So maybe you could think about that question or if you if you like want to answer uh, very briefly. Um, I actually kind of disagree with the fact that, you know, the public sphere had become, you know, Muslim public sphere, because I think there is, there was a lot of contestation, uh, you know, around the use of language and the kind of, you know, identity politics and this kind of association of people with um, Muslim specifically, I mean, and so, um, you know, Shama uh, itself, you know, and a lot of other film journals from this period, you know, are trying to, you know, fight back this kind of, you know, boxing of, uh, you know, Urdu film journals into this, you know, Muslim public sphere. And where they are talking of, you know, the Urdu film magazine as a kind of, you know, um, you know, for a wider readership, which is cosmopolitan and diverse and eclectic, uh, and not just, you know, Muslim readers. Uh, and many of the refugees from the Punjab who would have come and settled in Delhi, you know, from Lahore and so on, would have been fair. I mean, yeah. they would have known Urdu, so they would have been readers, presumably, right? And there are readers, you know, yeah. in, the, yeah. uh, in Hyderabad, in Calcutta, um, yeah. and, you know, other parts of India. So, um, yeah, I mean, the circulation figures are there to see, you know, that it's doing so well. Um, um, you know, it's been sold at such a, you know, huge market. Uh, the distribution is quite varied. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Iftikar, for that fascinating session. And thank you, especially, Sarah, for joining in from India. I hope the situation there improves soon. Uh, please uh, stay safe and take care of yourself. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. Our next seminar will be on the 10th of May where Dr. Swati Moitro from University of Calcutta will be speaking on mobile women, four anecdotes about book distribution. The session will be chaired by Professor Onindita Ghosh from the University of Manchester. Just note the change of time for this seminar. It will start at 4.45 instead of 5.30.
So thank you, everyone. Please take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Stay well. And thank you again, Sarah and Iftika. Thank um, you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.